Merry Christmas and welcome from Ben Church. We're so glad you are here to worship with us on this Sunday after Christmas day. We believe that everyone is beloved of God. And so wherever you are on your journey in faith, you're welcome and beloved here at Ben Church. Today, we're gonna talk about dwelling. Developed in the 14th century, the word dwell became known as a lingering or abiding. It had connections to inhabit, another word developed at that time. And after our Advent season of focusing on housing the holy, how will we linger and abide in this habit of hospitality? What habits did you invite into your heart in this season that you desire to take with you into this new year? And how might we sustain the dwelling places that feed, house, and clothe those who need it most? Join us. Today, we light the Christ candle again that illumines the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May Christ's light awaken us to possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. There is room in this inn, a house for the holy. The first reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. 
Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Abba God through him. The second reading is from Luke, second chapter, 41 to 52. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with people. It is the day after Christmas. And in the words of Will Ferrell in Talladega Nights, I want to keep praying to the baby Jesus. But what do we get? Adolescent Jesus. And he sounds just like a teenager, y'all. No offense to any teenagers. But seriously, he's annoying. The family has just been to Jerusalem for their yearly vacation for the Passover. And everyone, the whole extended family and group of friends are heading back home and have been on the road for an entire day when they look around and are like, oh, where's Jesus? And every time I read this, I always get that picture um, of the family in Home Alone when they realize their son isn't with them. Do you have him? I thought you had him. Ah! <laughs> so they run back home to Jerusalem and it takes them three days to find him. Three days of horror. Three days of not knowing where your beloved, whether your beloved son is alive or dead. And when they find him, whew, they lay into him. Why? Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been sick with worry. And he answers, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Let me just state that that would not have flown as an answer in my house growing up. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what Mary and Joseph must have been feeling? <clears throat> Three days of searching and, and then you find him in the temple and he's just fine. You know those warring feelings in your heart, torn between wanting to break down in tears of joy and laughter that your son was alive, and then also wanting to strangle him for putting you through three days of hell on earth. And he answers, why were you afraid? I'm here with God. Why was I afraid? Ha <laughs> ha. Well, I, I thought maybe you might be at the bottom of a ditch or with a slave dealer. Uh, I can imagine a number of places where you could have been. Yes, I was afraid. <laughs> Scripture says that his parents did not understand but that Mary treasured these things in her heart. <laughs> well, here we are on the cusp of a new year. Thank you, baby Jesus. And I wonder what it is that we treasure, what dwells in our hearts. 
and also what we are willing to let go of as we move into a new year. What fears are reasonable and what fears hold us back? What abides here? Because I think like Mary and Joseph, like people of every age, what we treasure most are our young, our children. Children that make us laugh when they giggle and they give us hope and they remind us of ourselves at their age, which is always frightening. <laughs> children are our greatest joys and you don't have to be a parent to feel that. In fact, one of my greatest joys in life right now is when I get to hold a baby in this congregation. They are just so squishy and sweet and they smell so good. And when they don't smell good or when they look the slightest bit upset, I just hand them back to their parents. Pure bliss, other people's children. <laughs> so the worst thing that can happen, the very worst thing, so bad that we don't talk about it unless we absolutely have to, is the death of a child. Not because we don't feel for those who have suffered the death of a child, but because it is too dear, it is too hard to even contemplate thinking about the loss of our children. It's not right. We're supposed to die first. And Jesus says, why were you so afraid? I am here with my father. <laughs> The good news can be so hard. I think that part of what gets me so angry about this text when I read it is that Jesus is right. Even as a teenager, Jesus is there to remind us to, to stop being so afraid. God is with us. And Jesus will go on telling us this his entire life. Sometimes he will say it outright. In, in Luke chapter 12, he will say, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or, what, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and your body is more than clothing. But you know, if you've read the Gospels, that underneath so many of his teaching is this theme of not being afraid. In chapter 10 of Luke, the, the story of the Samaritan who helped the stranger when the religious people would not, don't be afraid of strangers. Just don't be afraid. Mary treasured all of these things in her heart. What did she allow to dwell there and what did she let go of? Because I want to be like Mary. She must have been so afraid and she must have had to just let go of that fear. The fear of losing him, the fear of who he would become, the fear of what her friends and neighbors would say, the fear, the overwhelming fear of losing your child to death. And what did she treasure? What dwelled in her heart? I imagine that it was his life. Maybe the way he smiled, the way his hair got tangled, the way he stuck his tongue out of his mouth when he was concentrating on carving a piece of wood just so. Maybe the way he learned the scriptures by heart and not just learned them, but the way that he lived them. Did she treasure that? In this season of joy and laughter and hope and fear and mourning, I keep thinking of what we as a people treasure and what we are willing to let go of. The day I, I finished writing this sermon was the ninth anniversary of the killing of 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. You remember, 2012. And I think about the fear that was realized and I wonder about the fear that causes someone to want to own assault weapons. Now I was raised mostly in Texas. Um, I went out on deer leases 
any number of times. I'm a terrible shot, but I'm not in any way against owning a gun or, or hunting. But I wonder why we need weapons and artillery that are only for killing people quickly in our homes. I wonder what we are afraid of that makes us long for weapons like that in our homes, in our country, especially for people who call themselves Christians, because we have no reason to fear. What is death to us? We are people of the resurrection. We are Easter people. <laughs> What do we treasure? What is dwelling in our hearts? Because it's not supposed to be fear. And it is not supposed to be things either. If all we can think about when we remember this Christmas is that ring or rug or any other thing, then we have missed it. We've missed the message of Christmas. We missed the gift. Because the good news is the treasure that we were given is that we don't have to be afraid, friends. Death is certain, and it is not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is to live our lives treasuring the wrong things, not loving our neighbors. The worst thing is to live a life with no meaning, not caring for others, not diving in and participating in this crazy, exciting, sad, and glorious opportunity of life that God has given us. The good news is that God came, God took on human flesh, and learned what it was to be one of us. He was one without fear. Is that why he was one without sin? One who died, one who was crucified on a cross, and who turned what was a shameful death into a glorious resurrection, because God is with us. In our sorrows, God is with us. In our triumphs, God is with us. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are never alone. We have nothing to be afraid of. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. Over the course of the last several weeks, you have heard many, many stories of all the ways that Ben Church is partnering with our community, members, leaders who are reaching out to serve others. Now, as we go forth into a new year, we encourage you to imagine and dream with us about the ways that we can continue to serve. Thank you also for your continued support of Ben Church through your giving. There are two ways to give in this time. You can utilize our e-offering, which you can find on our website. You are also always welcome to send a check to the secure mailbox at the church.
tons of money too A holy child of earth and heaven Is born today for you Come kneel before the radiant boy Who brings you beauty, peace and joy Jesus, your We end our Advent Christmas worship series with one last Christmas carol. And this one is truly about Christmas Day. Good Christian Friends Rejoice is a medieval carol that would have been used for folk dancing rather than mass. A more boisterous piece and praise of the newborn child than was permitted in worship at the time. It was written in Latin and German and the original Latin reveals the heart of this song. In sweet jubilation, now sing and be joyful. The joy of our hearts lies in a manger and shined like the sun in the lap of his mother, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. Let us remember that the joy of our hearts lies in the simplest of mangers. May our church be a lap of the mother for those who need it most.
as we move into this new year, hear this benediction. May God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's first humble dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making room in the inn for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church. Amen.